Hi everyone, it's Ula McLaughlin here from Reaching for the Stars Children's Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today we have two very special guests with us. I'm here in Toronto and we have Fotini in London and George in Greece. Fotini, first let me introduce you to, is Fotini Papa Leonidopoulou is now 26 years old and is one of the kids that grew up at the SOS Children's Villages in Athens. At the age of 18, she moved to Patras, where she studied biology at the University of Patra. Upon finishing her studies, she received scholarships to undertake research in New York and the United Kingdom, and later she received her master's degree at the Imperial College in London in molecular medicine. Now, she is working as a research assistant at UCL Cancer Institute in London, and in September, she is starting her PhD at the Francis Crick Institute in London. You may remember Fotini in an iconic mm -hmm. moment, not just for Greece, but for SOS Children's Villages in Greece, where she was the young lady, young girl, who blew out the Olympic flame at the 2004 Olympics. And um, we all remember that, I know I do. So Fotini, welcome. We're so, we're so happy to have you with us. And we have, of course, George Kotopapas, our dear friend that we've known now, we're going on seven years, who is the director of SOS Children's Villages Greece. He started there as a baby at 25 years old yes. and has actually grown with SOS Children's Villages where there was only at the time six houses and 20 children. And now he has overseen, uh, after 35 years, this, this great charity grow in Greece. And we're so happy to support uh, SOS Children's Villages. So everyone, welcome. Um, first Hello. of all, thank you for being with me. How are you all? Hello, How we're fine. You, I will give this step to Fotini first. Uh, I'm fine. I'm in London, as you said. Uh, we are still in lockdown three months and we are waiting to start again. Our research is very behind, uh, but we are optimistic. We know things will not be the same as before, uh, but I, I hope that things will get better after a while. Uh, also from my side, I want to express my greetings to you, Vula, to uh, all our friends in Toronto, the members of the uh, Reaching for the Stars Children's Foundation, the board members, all supporters, all these seven years, you are uh, supporting our work, you are standing next and behind us, and especially now, this difficult moment, for me, this uh, open window that you are giving us, it, it, it gives me a very a, a big moral support for the continuation of our work because you are, you are still here, you are still with us. Hi. We I also want to express my greetings to Fotini. We speak sometimes. We are making uh, new plans. She is always and she has dedicated herself to the science but also to the SPS work. Uh, and I wish her all the best in these moments and I hope that I will see her this summer in Athens, except if things are going to be a bit tight. Yes. Well, yes, you know, speaking of this, I think we should just jump right into it, George, um, about what the current climate is. We all have, the whole world has gone through this. This isn't just, you know, in a specific country, and we're all going through it in different ways. What Denise said, you know, you're still on lockdown. I know here in Toronto, yeah. we're slowly getting out of it. Um, but now where you're at, and with the kids, um, you know, there's different areas that SOS is addressing in Greece. Yes, and, and, and I want to I want to get into that about how this pandemic now, um, how this is affecting your programs in Greece right now. Uh, the, the, SOS, the SOS programs, I mean, first of all, as you also have mentioned, this it was and it is a, a global a pandemic uh, a situation that uh, has affected all over the world, everyone. And of course, in Greece, uh, we managed uh, not to have a lot of uh, victims, a lot of deaths, uh, which it was excellent. Uh, but on, on the other side, we, uh, we, we faced and we implemented very 
strict safety guidelines, not only in the country, but also in the SOS villages, as we had the negative example of our friends from Italy, that two SOS villages were affected, SOS mothers, SOS caregivers, they were affected. So we tried our best to save our personnel, our children from this illness as in the beginning, but still now, it was fully unknown how to deal, how to work, and how to respond to that. Of course, at this moment, Greece is, is fully out of the lockdown. Uh, we are even uh, waiting for tourism, uh, which is, is, is another big question mark. What is going to bring tourism? Mm. Besides, besides the uh, business, besides the um, uh, economic side, we, are, we have a big question mark regarding uh, the COVID-19, how it's going to be affected to the islands, to the mainland, and what it will bring that uh, in our next day. Wow, that's, that's a lot. Um, you know, it it, you, you mentioned, it you mentioned um, the, the villages now. Yeah. The, this I, was, I just want to get a little specific. School was out, like everywhere in the world, right? It was there was no yeah. school. So look, I, I mean, uh, for us, as I said before, uh, the moment that in Greece the schools uh, they they were locked down and that it was uh, on March 11th, immediately, of course, with uh, the collaboration of the co-workers, the mothers, and everyone, we have implemented a strict safety uh, measurement into the villages, into the babies' houses, and in our youth houses, as all the personnel was locked down and remained in the villages for almost three months without taking any days of leave, nothing. The children, everyone, they remained inside, even into the villages. We, uh, we tried not to have a lot of contact between the, the children, so that, that it meant that one house or every two houses, the children, they were, they were staying a little bit out in the garden, but the usual contact or the, the usual uh, playtime or even the work in the libraries, that it was forbidden. We didn't, we didn't want the children, especially the first three weeks, we didn't want the children uh, to influence one the other because all of them were in school, everyone was in, a, in an everyday contact. So we didn't know then who could be uh, affected by the, uh, by the pandemic or by the uh, coronavirus. Um, that now, in our days, of course, the schools now they're open. So slowly, slowly, the life in the villages is coming back to a normality, uh, but still uh, we are uh, very careful. I will give you last Wednesday, it was the first day I visited the SOS village in Athens since uh, March 2nd. It's the first time in my life that I haven't been in a program of SOS so long. Wow. Uh, no one was entering, no one was living out. Um, it was it was something unique. It was something completely new. Uh, of course, we, we the personnel received a lot of stress in the beginning, but at the end, and that is for us, we feel very proud. At the end, and when I say at the end, that it was about mid of April, we managed to have the villages as a very safe place for the people and children living inside. As um, and even the personnel was relieved by the stress. Yeah. In the beginning, we had uh, one or two SOS mothers, one uh, lady from the babies program. They quit. They decided not to leave us. Uh, all this situation, um, it was never implemented uh, in our problems, not only, but I believe globally. Uh, so at, at the end, the personnel especially because the children immediately uh, they understood the situation we have uh, given them information uh, so the children they, they felt more relaxed at the end the personnel also felt so safe so they weren't 
going back to the house because as everywhere was a lockdown, they felt more safe in the village environment. Right. And, and, and your t the kids, at yeah. first, what was their initial reaction? They were like, I know with our kids, we, we are, we're figuring it out just in our, our family. I mean, you have so many kids that you have to look after and, and manage these emotions. And were, was there fear? Was there um, confusion? Uh, it, it, you know, uh, for, us, for us, it was especially for the village in Athens, it was an additional element at the beginning that it had created a lot of stress because one of the uh, teachers of the public elementary school in the area, it was one of the very, very, very first uh, affected uh, people by the coronavirus. So the first two weeks, it was a, a, a very scary atmosphere in the village as she had under her care more than 14 of our children. So no one knew and no one could, could uh, find out if one of our children or even more, uh, they were influenced by the teacher. Right. So uh, that it was very critical. And in the beginning, I say the two, these first three weeks, even for our children, the situation, it was extremely, extremely stressing because we weren't able even to give them information uh, if it, they were affected, if they weren't affected, if they were only carrying the virus and they were able to affect the mothers or the aunts. So right. the first two, three weeks, I believe also that it was in every normal family, no one was able to give a proper information as also from the side of the doctors, from the side of the um, authorities. It wasn't a very clear picture of, of this pandemic. Uh, I don't know if in Canada or in London, I'm not speaking about England because they, they were following a different philosophy. Everyone in the street, everyone open. So, but I mean, that in the beginning, the first month, and especially end of February, no March, no one of the uh, specialists was able to give a direct guideline uh, besides the lockdown and be careful, be attended. But then slowly, slowly, uh, by using methods of psychology, or even we have um, implemented the new technologies in the village, which it was another pain, as we weren't ready to, to expand the technological and equipment supporting our children. But slowly, slowly, we gave them more time, more information inside the houses. Um, and, you know, as the kids, they understand and they learn much more quicker than the adults, uh, they found their ways to understand it, but also because we managed to create a safe environment. That, that for us, it was a huge success. Uh, and we saw that in the, in the relief of their faces, but also in the relief of the sentiments of the personnel. I remember I was speaking with our Italian colleagues and especially the villages that they were affected. They were trying to find personnel able to take the risk to enter to the village as it, as it was a village that it was affected. So all, all these situations, they are creating the fear because one of the biggest elements and one of the biggest emotions that is it covered everything uh, even our behavior it was fear right so the children they managed on the beginning they felt uncomfortable but slowly slowly as i said we we succeed to create a, a safe environment so i will give you a very small example in athens or in thessaloniki everywhere uh, when, when the decision of the lockdown was taken, you couldn't bring your child to the playground. You couldn't. So it was locked in an apartment. So you can imagine in a village, after three weeks, our children, they were able at least to play. At least to play in the, in the village environment, the village's playground. But it was something. Uh, it, was, it was a big step that they were able to express uh, their energy.
Mm -hmm. Which is very important. It's, as human beings, mm -hmm. we've seen that this, uh, this shift has really brought out the best in people and the worst. And we've seen some crazy things happen. Um, but just <laughs> the basic necessities. And you, you talked about this, that the kids felt safe. This yep. is, has been one of, if not the biggest reason we support SOS Children's Villages is the environment that we've witnessed and we've gone to visit, and I've gone every year, except for this year, of course, but I, I look forward to coming again, is these pillars that we believe in uh, and surrounding the kids with the mother, with the siblings, with the village. Um, this is very important. And it is during crisis like this that you see just how important that foundation is for children to lean into. And I want to bring it, I want to bring Fotini in on this because who better to speak about this than someone who has actually grown up? It's one thing for me to witness it. It's one thing for you to run a program, but it is very special to to Fotini and talk to her and her experience of being raised in this environment. So Fotini, I'm going to bring you in here. Um, okay. If that's okay, and and talk to us about. Uh, what you felt growing up in this environment in the SOS village. So if you think of what is family, family is a very, very holy um, concept in every, in every culture, in every religion, in every part of the world. But when we are talking about SOS family and SOS siblings, it gets a bigger, a greater value and worth. And I'm telling that because at the point that children enter this source family, they have been through difficult situations and they have gone through hardships you can never imagine. So to be at this very vulnerable uh, period of their lifetime, which is at the age of five, six or seven years old, to be able to be in an environment where you get love, support, uh, respect, are the most fundamental things of this uh, source village foundation and this concept and uh, my experience uh, was big because i was since seven years old and i would consider myself up at, until now uh, although now i'm uh, i'm independent and i live on my own i have my home and my work but until last year when i was 25 years old i was supported by the source villages. Can you imagine that? And an organization would be responsible for a kid until 18 years old. But yeah, maybe but the I, best case scenario. Th this is where the element of real family comes in because, you know, I know that we don't just sign off our kids and say, see you later at 18. They might need our support at 20, 21, 22, right? That's, that's real. Yeah walking with them as young adults and being committed to them. And it says something about the organization. And, you know, I, I remember when I went to go visit Fotini and I went to the youth house, it was a couple of years ago and you were there and you went to yeah. go visit because this is your family and this is your home. Yeah. And not only because I, I wanted personally to visit them, but because it was my natural home. This was the place to go when I was studying in Patras and I had my holiday vacation in Christmas, uh, Easter or summer vacation. And I would go there in Athens and I would live there. So I, she, help, yeah. she always she always had her own room in the in the youth house waiting for her, as in every family that uh, your kid lives. He studies in another city, maybe in a Ontario or in Vancouver, and then he comes back to Toronto to the to the family house, and he's still having his own private space. And I would like to mention something that during this difficult time, besides the children in the villages, because the baby's home, it was the 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 most uh, under control as the majority of babies. So babies they don't have a lot of school attending. Or things to do. Right. So uh, the baby program it was the softest, uh, but I mean for the for the children living in the semi-independent 
process of the life, like Fotini, that she was studying outside of Athens. Our caregivers, our pedagogues of the youth house, with the, the risk of receiving a penalty, they were not only contacting them and speaking with them, which it was easy, but sometimes they were visiting them even in the flats we are renting for them, and they were locked down. So to, to increase the solidarity, to increase the link and the relation that is, look, out that someone is, is, is taking care of is, uh, is interest for you outside there. You're not alone locked in an apartment in a small flat, not an apartment. Uh, we are here, we are together. You know, and this is very significant. I, I, you know, we've been on this journey and we take it for granted that I know SOS really well, right? And I want to explain to people how this all works. There's so many programs that SOS supports and I want to get mm -hmm. into a few more of them. What we've supported and we've tried to in the last few years is specific families, one in Vadi, uh, the uh, village in Vadi, one in Thessaloniki, one in Crete now, and the uh, babies program. And when I go, I go to the youth house to stay. So there's, there's what I have come to witness is the support in every stage of life that SOS supports, right? From newborns in hospitals where parents, uh, you know, aren't able to take care for whatever situation the child is put there, that the state has trusted SOS to become a part of that. And going into actually the family environment where a lot of people ask me, well, is this their foster home? They think it's like a, a foster home yeah. stay temporarily. And I said, no, you know, this is their permanent home. SOS is, has the rights to these children, the parental rights. And then we go into the youth house, which is that later stage of they graduate almost into more independent, semi-independent living, where I have witnessed, I've stayed in the youth house. And you're right, it's, you have this feeling of family, that someone's always there for you. I went and I would see in, this, in the meeting area where you know, people are yeah. there, we're all talking and we're having coffee and everybody knows where everyone's going and what everyone's doing, which is very, very similar to a family. If not, it is a family. And you That's also then have other programs to support families who are already intact, but need the help so that we can keep yeah. families together. And I wanted you to go into a little bit of that. If, if what, yeah. what the need yeah. is, the work that you're doing. Yeah, uh, and also I will mention something that is increasing due to the, the pandemic. I would like one, only one thing to mention that through your help, you're not supporting only the family in the village, but also every step of the children into the youth house and then up to the independence of their life. Because I will remind you that Marilena, the first girl with the SOS mother that was in the fourth or the third year of the Reaching for the Stars event, yes. um, you supported through this donation her studies, and she she studied, uh, I think, uh, something uh, connecting to fashion, and then she found a job, and now she lives independently. I think also she's. Uh, getting engaged, uh, engaged, so I'm not so sure. But I mean, Marilena and now Constantinos, the the young man, the young adult that it was last year, yes. he's ready to start his studies that are still supported, are continue supported by your events and by the donors and supporters of the Children's Foundation. But coming coming back to the to the other programs, as you said, the SS programs, of course, we don't, as the society, as the Greek society has received a lot of difficulties in uh, 2010, 2011, uh, and we had the huge and the severe economic crisis. We had initiated programs supporting families not to break down because it is important to keep up the family, the biological family. So these programs, now we see that they are facing again the difficulties of what we have seen in back in the beginning of 2010. Mm. We, have started, uh, we have started the program with the municipality of Athens. It was mid of April. We started a helpline with 
to the collaboration of the municipality to support families uh, to uh, reach the domestic violence cases that have been seen or uh, as the number of uh, domestic violence has increased even increased due to the uh, to the coronavirus and uh, from september we are starting programs with five municipalities from Crete to Thessaloniki to support families that they have faced the difficulties that they are facing the unemployment because unemployment is here again as a lot of tourist business a lot of small businesses uh, even the air companies are firing people all the jobs they are becoming less and less so unemployment is still in in front of us mm -hmm. and of course is affecting the most vulnerable the most vulnerable so we are uh, uh, creating a program in five municipalities trying to first of all educate the existing personnel of the municipalities especially the social workers the psychologists the personnel that is involved with children uh, to try to give them the support needed to become able to deal with such situations. So we are creating a kind of a sustainability program. And also we are planning to work with very young children, years between uh, three to six, uh, who they face the lockdown, able, enabling them to uh, give them an opportunity and also a therapeutic uh, support for what they have lived, but especially for uh, what could probably happen again to their life uh, if the coronavirus and this pandemic is going to be repeated, which is again uh, a sense and a feeling of fear because we have passed it, but everyone is shaking his hand his finger and says, no, we haven't finished yet. Right. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Yeah, I, th I think we're all going uh, through that psychologically, right? We're, we're trying to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Um, and this, this Vula is also blocking the, uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to say, this, uh, this insecureness is also blocking, especially the private people, to express their willingness to donate some amounts to charities because you have to take care for yourself, you have to take care for your family, you have to take care for your parents or your relatives. So your immediate surrounding is the first thing in your mind. And this unknown of the tomorrow is not leaving you able to think of other people or charities or uh, other things that they could need your financial support, which is, of course, is always important to have. I, th I think on the, you're right. I think uh, on the flip side, though, I think there are also, this there's a, this also heightened awareness of connectivity and yeah. what's important in life and where our money should go versus where it was going, perhaps. Um, and I, I've talked to some supporters and donors who feel that way. And, um, you know, it gives me hope so that we can continue what we've been doing. What I wanted to touch on though, was in a place like Canada, the social system, the welfare system, the, the services are very different. And in Greece, there's more pressure on charities to provide these kinds of services. And, and so you're feeling this right now as an organization, which is what you went through is these new programs that you're trying to put together because the government doesn't have the capability to do this. Yes, that's true. And that is uh, that has remained due to the economic, the economic Greek crisis and the memorandum signed to receive the European support uh, that has declined the personnel uh, in the municipalities and, and in the in the state uh, programs, and that's 
and that it was what it it was provided by SOS and other charitable organizations. It, it was the personnel, besides the experience, because we are experienced, but also the personnel to manage to work and support the people in need. When we started the helpline with the municipality of Athens, they only had one person for this helpline. Uh, this help. So one person cannot deal with more than one for phone call. Right. And also, that, uh, also, what we did is we gave them two psychologists additionally. So the, the line was working from nine in the morning till seven, eight in the evening, six days per week. So, and the new agreements we, we have established with the municipalities is to give them the personnel they need to increase their capacity to receive more applications of needs from the side of the most vulnerable people. And of course, to work with them to, uh, to try to solve as much as we can the problems they are facing. It's like the baby's problem. The baby's problem, why it was initiated? Because in every, first of all, they didn't have the, 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 the right personnel to, uh, to fulfill all their places. So we received a, a wink that it was empty. Now 15, 16 babies, they live there. And we have three persons in every shift when the public system is having only two. We have one doctor for, for 20 hours for that program, when in Greece and in Athens especially, they have one pediatrician for, uh, we have one pediatrician 20 hours for 15 babies. When they have one pediatrician, 40 hours for about 200 babies. Oh my goodness. So, I mean, even if you divide, if you if you split him in three, still this poor doctor cannot fulfill uh, the needs of the babies. And you know, babies they had fever one day, fever another day, yeah. some other thing. And they're not uh, they're not infant or young children. So that that it, the bad thing that we live in, in Greece at the moment is the lack of personnel in this specific area uh, and it, it remains because now due to the crisis and of course that it was uh, as a as a benefit and a bravo for the new government they have uh, hired more people but especially for the hospitals mm -hmm. uh, i can say for greece this uh, pandemic has increased the capacity of the greek hospitals uh, and we could and i can say we are ready for uh, a, sec a second epidemic in a much better situation than what we were five months ago but th this is focused uh, only for the health system regarding hospitals but not for the social uh, social uh, care that uh, is running in the other problems now that has remained in the days of the 90s, hasn't changed. Sorry, I didn't get that last part. But, but, but has remained in the, in, the, in, the, in the 90s, back in the 90s. Whatever, whatever is, is, is around the social care is still lacking uh, in Greece uh, a lot. You know, and this is where um, SOS has really stepped up. You know, it's not just a trusted organization in. Greece only, which we've seen. So I, I remember during the economic crisis, there were charities all over the place popping up. Um, and, you know, SOS was really one that has really stood the test of time all over the world in over 135 countries. And, um, you know, we work with the guys over here in Canada too. Uh, and we've seen the work that you've done and how, in, especially in Greece, the government has had to lean in on, on very, um, experienced charities and transparent organizations. I can't stress how transparent the organization is. My own personal experience to be able to come and see you and live it and be a part of it and not only get to know the children, 
but the personnel. And yeah. the one thing I have to say, when you're talking about personnel, I think naturally there's going to be some turnover. But seven years, I've known you. I've seen the same people. And that to me says a lot about the organization, but that family uh, environment, not just from a child's perspective, but also from a work perspective that we're in this together and that people have really grown with the organization. Yeah. So the people that you have have been amazing, amazing people. Fotini, I wanted to kind of loop you in again in your beautiful face and I want, <laughs> I want to hear your beautiful voice. You know, I, I've thought about this and I hope it's okay to, to ask this. Do you ever think about if you hadn't been raised in SOS? Did you ever think about that as, as this young woman now who, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, you, you have succeeded beyond success. I mean, everyone's so proud of you. Look at you. I mean, the things that you've accomplished. Have you ever thought, what if I didn't go in this path? I think this is very clear. I wouldn't have achieved any of these things. And it's obvious that I would, what you say I have achieved is a collective effort. Uh, I had people that supported me all these years. And maybe we have many dreams. And maybe I was thinking back then when I was a kid that I want to become a scientist. But I had people who uh, believed in me and supported me uh, with uh, private classes, with uh, internships abroad, uh, with my uh, undergrad degree, my master's degree. So I, it's, it's to them, not to me. Uh, so no, it's obvious. No, I, I disagree because <laughs> not only you put in it, but a lot of children, you have the guts. Uh, you have the guts to succeed. We only just uh, lean the carpet, but you are walking on the carpet. Mm. And you can do that. Uh, you have the, not the manpower, as I said, you have the courage. Besides the intelligence, because a lot of kids are intelligent, a lot of kids are clever, is where you use this kind of mind. Uh, and uh, you also are passionate, uh, like also a lot of kids from your family house, like Ioana and others, uh, that you battled to succeed to your life. Uh, we, together with Vula and other donors, we gave you only the path, but you have walked it. So, As they say, I yeah. myself and my circumstances. <laughs> yeah. so, yes, but no, no. Well, I, I think no. as, as parents, and in this case, we're kind of adoptive parents as supporters, um, we just sow a seed or we, we hope, you know, uh, the best to give the best circumstance for children uh, so that they can reach their full potential. And that's really what yeah. we all, all want for our kids. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, our kids that we've supported, they're our kids. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, we have a commitment that we've made and we, will, we are gonna stand by it, even though this crazy world has forced us to adapt in a different way. Um, I know that there are wonderful people out there who, who really want to help. Um, and we need to just show them that, hey, the kids are still here, they, they still need us. And, and we want to continue to walk with them, uh, just like those who've walked with Fotini and continued. Um, you know, this pandemic is what we make of it. And I know in our home, um, our kids are not, you know, afraid. And how we react to the situation is how they're going to react to the situation. And what we do and how we support them and how they remember this. Uh, and I know that what SOS does is, is very clear. I've seen the teams, I've seen the psychologists, the pedagogues, yeah. I've seen all of them and just how much they understand that the psychological support has to be there when the kids go through this. So I have no doubt in my mind that you all are, are really caring for these children. And one, just to remind you that that's, that's why also we, we felt very obliged to our personnel because not only the SOS mothers or the SOS aunts, they were uh, 
uh, locked inside the villages, but also the pedagogues who they are eight hour shift, but the pedagogues, uh, the psychologists, they were remaining 70, each one 72 hours. Then he was three days off and then again 72 hours because we understood that together they can create, first of all, between them a, a, a safer environment, but also to, towards the kids, but that you are not abandoned them, that you're not yes. just walking away, but they all, they were all there. And that's something I have to uh, clarify that these personnel, that the, the mothers, they were locked for three months on the road continuously, but also the pedagogues, uh, they, they did a, a, a super work for them, for themselves, but mm -hmm. mainly for the children. And that is something we have to, yeah so, let's be clear. yeah, so let's be clear about that. Typically, in this pandemic, people's work was either they could do it at home or from the computer, um, yeah. or maybe they were an essential service, so they went into work, but they went back home. In this case, you know, the commitment, A, it was you stayed in the village. Usually, you would go to work and go back home. So you had to stay overnight, and you were staying for longer periods of time. Even the SOS mm -hmm. mothers who would stay, they would get a day off, we'll say, yeah. to go back um, to their yeah. home. But in this case, See the parent. Yeah. right. So to your point, this plays the commitment, the level of commitment that the personnel had for the children so they could embody and show them in real life, mm -hmm. but they were not going to abandon them. That is especially yeah. in a time like this. So this is very important to clarify. And, and for me, and for me, even the three, three out of the 65 SOS, SOS mothers and aunts who had three that they left due to panic as we didn't right. know uh, what would, even that it was much more fair than to remain inside and be negative. They decided to, to I don't remember how they just were, to, to stop working. Right. Because they couldn't, they, they couldn't, they couldn't receive this uh, enormous responsibility. So for me, that even that, it was much more honest yes. than to remain inside and be negative and right. be it, against it's and, more and start making stories. Right. It's a more responsible approach yeah. to yeah. to do that instead of putting the fears and anxiety on the children. Um, yeah. And, and thank you even for being that. honest and, and letting us know that that was the current situation. And, you know, it's, it's going to happen. And this is, these are human beings too, that are going through this, you know? Um, so, well, you know, I think we covered a lot here today and, um, and I appreciate you being with us. We here don't know exactly what's going on yet either. Um, we're kind of in the iffy mode. We're not sure, uh, but we do know that our commitment to the kids We've renewed it. We're going to continue. I know last year we had gone above what we thought we yeah. would. And, um, you know, we want to step up to the plate again. And we are going to, you know, reach out to our supporters and share this with them. Um, so, you know, we know you're doing that work. Uh, and it's very important work. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I want to mention as you open that kind of support for the next year, that this, this time, these three... Uh, specific months, they were worse than the period of the crisis in Greece because back in 2010, 2011 is, is what I'm saying to our donors, that we had a, a decrease of 60% or 50% of income due to unemployment, to the financial situation, etc., etc. But still people were around. Still, I will give an example, but I'm not use, I don't want to use the name. We, we have a long term supporter which is it's a company that uh, is more than 12 years supporting our work during the crisis they were um, of course facing difficulties and it was dropped the donation uh, by 60 percent from what they used in nowadays this specific uh, the company uh, was locked down. Oh. Uh, and of course, 
the donation that the donation it was connected with the monthly turnover of the company so for three months we received 40 euros 160 euros and 170 euros the third month uh, insist of 15,000 every month wow. so this is an enormous of the hotels we had hotels that they were supporting the village in crete by the food aid support so they were all closed so of course they couldn't function uh, the supplies they couldn't function anything so of course it was it was a zero procedure in income it was zero because it was a lot of businesses they closed down a lot of businesses they had to lock down and of course they couldn't fulfill the willingness it's not an obligation it's a willingness and that that gap cannot be covered in the coming months you, you're by no means. we talked about this offline but your donations are down how much 80 percent 80 percent because you know one thing it was the cancelling of activities like bazaars near easter and then the the big especially the, the companies some of them they, they closed they had to lock down some others due to the sensitivity of the need that has been created by the pandemic they have shifted the uh, uh, social responsibility supporting the hospitals supporting the ER, er room i mean which is normal i mean because especially in greece we weren't so well uh, uh, state in, in, in the hospital so they, they turned some of the social responsibility towards that and also the private donations the donations on memory no one was, was doing anything and as fear has covered all all the all our mind no one could think that there is also someone that is poor or is, uh, neglected or which it was in the in the first years of the crisis that it was immediate coming in the in, in the in the mind of some but here as no one knew if it's going to be affected tomorrow it's going to be alive of course your your family your children your mother and father your wife is the first thing that you are thinking of right yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, you're right. I think we were all in a place of, especially all we were looking at was social media. You couldn't go outside. And, you know, the, the, the charities yeah. that were top of mind were, and, and rightly so, frontline workers, PPE, all of this. And of um, course, of course, right? And so yeah. even for us as a, as a foundation, we took a step back and we said, you know, let's be more thoughtful about uh you know what our approach is and even living through it as a mother i school my kids from 10 to 3. um i'm their teacher i'm you know we, matt my husband he's the one who takes them out for exercise so we're everything to them and we understand what how the responsibility of each child you know what you need to provide for them when you're there with them all the time so naturally as the weeks went by i think we really felt very comfortable to say okay now we're ready to talk about this and talk about, hey, the kids have gone yeah. through all of this and they might go through it again. So how do we provide this support? And it's still important um, that, you know, we keep them top of mind. So you're right, it's, it's been a journey, um, but we will, we will get through it and we are getting through it. And I know that Greece is starting to open up and hopefully London, yeah. I don't know what Boris is gonna do for Dini, but. <laughs> And maybe maybe Fotini could say how she felt as an individual psychologically with this situation because she's 26, uh, as you know, uh, for me is always Fotini of the of nine year old and uh, or ten years old. That's a good but thing. I mean, individual, individ, as an individual, could say the feelings that they capture here uh, in this living in London also in this lunatic case that. No, I knew when things they would start. You know what? The f I want to step in and say that first of all, when all this started, the first thought that I had is, what is going on in Greece? What is happening in the source villages? I didn't worry really? more about anybody else more than the source <laughs> villages. And we ex exchanged an email with you, George, 
And I also yeah. talked with Lemonis, the director of Stegi. And my concern was what's going on now? Because donors, of course, that will be the first response. That if I don't have the money to give to, to my, you know, if I worry for my family mm. or my extended family, how can I give and sponsor another organization? So the first reaction is to keep what I have because we don't know what will be tomorrow. So, but after, other than this, uh, I think it was very, for me, it was different, I think, because pandemic is something that I, I understand. I'm a biologist, so I, I could handle this. I knew that by staying home, washing my hands, be very careful and cautious when I go outside, I would limit to zero the chances of getting uh, the COVID-19. But realizing what is going on on the internet, the conspiracy theories, the theory that spread, I mean, that was very, very scary because they are vulnerable people. They are kids that are online nowadays and they can read everything. So that was scary. And I really, and my worries now is what is going, what is going to happen to the social villages? Because, I mean, it's a huge organization. Uh, you explained everything and I have, I have lived that. And back then, in the Greek crisis, I was in Stegi. I knew what it is to have uh, um, uh, to live. Be, yes. To live through a crisis. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So I know all these because I have experienced them. So I really hope that uh, next year will be better. And twenty twenty one, not earlier. Well, no, I think I think we still have time in 2020. I think <laughs> that, that um, you know we've seen we've seen the best in people. I really do. I you know although we have some some uh, stressful, anxious people that are you know dealing with their own fears in in life. I think mm -hmm. what's going on. I do think we we have seen the best in people, and people rise to the occasion. And I know that we can we can look forward to that. Even maybe it might be in a different way. But that's okay. Um, different. We we have to learn to adapt to this new situation. Um, but I'm looking forward. I know that I was supposed to come in March when all of this had happened. Yeah. And um, I, I was supposed to go I remember, there. I remember. I remember you were saying, "I'm going to take the plane." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm still coming. But I, don't, but I don't think that the plane took off. Yeah. Ever from <laughs> it never did. It, it's so funny. I was I was gonna go, and I remember my own mother. So I'm in my 40s, and <clears throat> my own mother was like, "Vula, be careful. I don't want you. I don't want you to go." And I said, "No, I want to show my support. We're gonna go." And then I got the phone call where the the village was on lockdown. Yeah. This was right before everything globally had just yeah. gone crazy. Yeah, we did it. We did it uh, ten days earlier. Right. We did it ten, ten days earlier. Right. So having said that, though, I, you know, I look forward to coming. I am going to come again. I am going to be there and I'm going to visit you guys once this all blows over. And um, yeah. but in the meantime, we do the best that we can with what we have. Right. And so that's what yeah. our commitment to you. And um, and I want to thank you both for being with me from London and thank from Greece. Uh, I, it's I, very nice to see you both. I, I miss you guys. Me too. Um, and, uh, thank you so much. I, thank I, you so, so much. It's, I think, honestly, George, even though it's much later right now in Greece, it looks so much brighter <laughs> over there. <laughs> <laughs> Greece. Uh, yeah. The bright great. side of life. The it bright is. side of life. Well, Greece is... Uh, I want, go ahead. I want, I want to express my warmest wishes to everyone for health, safety, and strength. To each one of you, and to you, Fotini, and to all your families, and brothers, sisters, every, every, everyone. Uh, we have to keep walking, we have to be together. And thank you so much for giving us this window of hope. Uh, through this room. Well, we're, we're walking with you, and we're standing with you. And Fotini, it was, uh, it was great to see your beautiful face. And <laughs> yours. continued success. <laughs> Uh, in your in your life in London, and you know, hopefully, if I get to Greece, I get to see you too. At yes, of course. Yeah. Next time you will do a stopover in London, or we're going to bring Fotini 
for some days even though I know that with uh, her uh, new studies from September she will be overloaded uh, for four years <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's my mindset. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was great to connect with you all. I appreciate you uh, doing this with me today. And it's very important that we let everyone know what's going on and why it's still uh, very important to continue to support. So thank you so much for this. Uh, and one, uh, one more thing. I mean, the moment lockdown uh, completed in Greece, four new children they joined the SOS village in Crete wow. and it was funny because even this kind of processes they have stopped all these okay. three months and immediately as everything is that moved unfortunately four more children they joined the village in Crete uh, unfortunately uh, saying uh, from the side of the difficulties of biological families otherwise for those children of course it, it's going to be a better uh, situation uh, so things slowly, slowly, they are coming back to normality, even the good, even the bad things. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know what? Thank, well, you. thank you so much, and we will. Well, thank you, thank you, thank and you. I personally thank you and the people in Canada. Thank you, Fontini. I appreciate that, and thanks for for joining us today. And you know, we'll we'll maybe connect soon, uh, George, and we'll give an update uh, again later on in the year, uh, yeah. specifically maybe with our families. But thank you so much, and uh, we will say bye for now. Bye, bye to everyone. Bye.